Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to go over some of the releases that are coming out in March. So I have a handful of books here that are going to be coming out in March that I thought were pretty interesting and I wanted to go ahead and share them with you. As is typical in these videos, since they are new releases and I don't know a whole heck in ton about them, I will be doing a lot of synopsis reading. This is just to give you an idea of what these books are and what they are about so that you can determine whether or not you are interested in them as well. And so without further ado, we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. Starting on March 7th, which I believe is the very first Tuesday in March and typically new releases come out on Tuesday, we have The Kind Worth Saving by Peter. Peter Swanson. I'm mentioning this in case you are a Peter Swanson fan and you have read The Kind Worth Killing. I personally have not read The Kind Worth Killing. I believe that is a take on the strangers on a train trope where you have two people who are offering to kill each other's spouses and it sounds like in this one you're going to be following some of the same characters that you followed in that one including Henry Kimball and I believe he is a private investigator. In this one he is approached by a woman named Joan, a woman that he knew in his past as an English teacher and I guess it was during this time as an English teacher when he was in the center of a tragedy but now this woman needs his help proving that her husband is cheating. But it's not just a simple case of infidelity because Kimball finds two bodies in an uninhabited suburban home with a for sale sign out front. And suddenly he feels like he is back in the past where this tragedy occurred. Is it possible Joan knows something about that day, something she's hidden all these years? Could there still be a killer out there, someone who believes they have gotten away with murder? Henry is determined to find out, but as he steps closer to the truth, a murderer is getting closer to him. And in this hair raising game of cat and mouse, only one of them will survive. So this actually sounds really interesting to me. I don't think you need to read The Kind Worth Killing before you read The Kind Worth Saving. I just wanted to go ahead and mention it here. And like I said, this comes out on March 7th. Next on the 7th, we have a new release from William Landay. He wrote Defending Jacob. And this is another one that I read many, many, many years ago. I remember nothing about this one except for the twist. And since then, I have not read anything by William Landay. But when I saw this was coming out and I read the synopsis, it actually really intrigued me. It says, one afternoon in November 1975, 10-year-old Miranda Larkin comes home from school to find her house eerily quiet. Her mother is missing. Nothing else is out of place. There is no sign of struggle. Her mom's pocketbook remains in the front hall in the usual spot. So begins a mystery that will span a lifetime. What happened to Jane Larkin? Investigators suspect Jane's husband, a criminal defense attorney, Dan Larkin, would surely be an expert in outboxing the police. But no evidence is found linking him to a crime, and the case fades from the public's memory, a simmering unresolved riddle. Jane's three children, Alex, Jeff, and Miranda, are left to be raised by the man who may have murdered their mother. Two decades later, the remains of Jane Larkin are found. The investigation is awakened. The children, now grown, are forced to choose sides, with their father or against him, guilty or innocent, and what happens if they are wrong? A tale about family, family secrets, and vengeance, but also family love. All that is mine I carry with me. Masterfully grapples with a primal question. When does loyalty reach its limit? So I just love the overall premise of this. So first of all, you have a missing mom. And of course, the husband is going to be the number one main suspect because of course he is. He always is, right? And so not only do you have that, but because they can't prove a case against him, he gets to keep his children. And so now their children are going to be raised and grow up with the man who may be responsible for their mother's disappearance. And that sounds really interesting to me. I have a feeling this book is going to take one of two directions. And I'm interested to see which way it goes. Is it going to go in the direction of defending Jacob where you spend the whole entire book thinking it couldn't possibly this way and then it ends up being that way or if it's going to take a very different direction. So I am super intrigued by this one. I'm absolutely going to be adding it to my TBR because this sounds phenomenal and I want to see what more William Landay can do as a thriller author. So I'm very excited about this one. This next one that I'm going to mention also coming out on March 7th seems like it's going to be kind of a contemporary literary fiction that follows three sisters from a very wealthy family that kind of go in different directions and the consequences of that and of course the drama that comes along with it. It's called Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson. This little blurb at the bottom says, rife with the indulgent pleasures of life among New York's one percenters. Pineapple Street is a smart escapist novel that sparkles with wit. It's about the peculiar unknowability of someone else's family, the miles between the haves and have nots, and everything in between and the insanity of first love. Personally, there's nothing about this book that actually stands out to me, but I did want to go ahead and mention it here just in case it does sound intriguing to you because like I said, I have seen it going around as one of the more popular March releases and that's why I wanted to go ahead and mention it here. So again, that's Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson, and it comes out on the 7th of March. Another one that's coming out on March 7th that seems to be going around and is very popular is The Golden Spoon by Jessa Maxwell. This is a thriller suspense novel. It says, a killer is on the loose when someone turns up dead on the set of a hit TV banking competition in this starkly beguiling debut mystery that is perfect for fans of Lucy Foley, Nita Prose, and Anthony Horowitz. Soon to be a limited series on Hulu. Okay, so this is already getting adapted. It mentions Nita Prose. Anita Prose, I believe she's the one that wrote The Maid, which was kind of like a cozy mystery. So it sounds like this might have a cozy 
lazy aspect to it if it's mentioning Nita Prose. So I'm not entirely sure how this one's going to go, but let me read you the synopsis. Production for the 10th season of Bake Week is ready to begin at the gothic estate of host and celebrity chef Betsy Martin, and everything seems perfect. The tent is up, the top tier ingredients are aligned, and the crew has their cameras at the ready. The six contestants work to prove their culinary talents over the course of five days. While Betsy is less than thrilled to share the spotlight with a new co-host, the brash and unpredictable Archie Morris. But as the baking competition commences, things begin to go awry. At first, it's merely sabotage. Sugar replaced with salt, a burner turned too high, but when a body is discovered, everyone is a suspect. A deliciously suspenseful thriller for murder mystery buffs and avid bakers alike, the golden spoon will keep you guessing until the very last page. Okay, so I'm definitely getting the cozy aspect of it. Cozy is really not my thing when it comes to mysteries, but this is another one that is making the rounds, and like I said, it is being adapted. I think, actually, this would be one that would be more fun for me to watch than read, and this is probably going to be perfect for fans of, like, those baking shows, like The Great British Bake Off. I've never seen any of them, but those are the vibes that I'm getting. It sounds like it's just going to be a good time. It doesn't sound like it's going to be anything too serious or dark, and so if you kind of avoid dark mystery thrillers, this could be one that you want to check out, because it doesn't sound like it's going to get too gruesome or anything like that. I actually have a fantasy on this list that is coming out on the 7th. It is The Foxglove King by Hannah Witten. I was reading the synopsis of it, and it sounded really interesting. It says, when Laura was 13, she escaped a cult in the catacombs beneath the city of Dallaire. Okay, you know, like right there, you have cult, big buzzword, right? And in the 10 years since, she's lived by one rule, don't let them find you. Easier said than done when her death magic ties her to the city. Mortem, the magic born from death, is a high price and illicit commodity in Del Air, and Laura's job running poisons keeps her in food, shelter, and relative security. But when a run goes wrong and Laura's power is revealed, she's taken by the Presque Mort, a group of warrior monks sanctioned to use Mortem, working for the sainted king. Laura fully expects a pyre, but King August has a different plan. Entire villages on the outskirts of the country have been dying overnight, seemingly at random. Laura can either use her magic to find out what's happening and who in the king's court is responsible or die. Laura is thrust into the sainted king's glittering court, where no one can be believed and even fewer can be trusted. Guarded by Gabriel, a duke turned monk, and continually running up against Bastion, August's ne'er-do-well heir, Laura tangles in politics, religion, and forbidden romances as she attempts to navigate a debauched and opulent society. But the life she left behind in the catacombs is catching up with her, and even as Laura makes her way through the sainted court above, they might be drawing closer than she thinks. This overall just sounded really fascinating to me, and so I wanted to go ahead and mention it here. Witten is not an author that I'm familiar with, but it says that she is a New York Times bestselling author, so she definitely has a backlist if you're interested in checking it out. But I do know that this one does sound intriguing to me, and it sounds like it's going to be the first in her Nightshade Kingdom series or trilogy, so be on the lookout for that one if that sounds intriguing to you. And the last one we have coming out on March 7th is What Have We Done by Alex Finley. Y'all know that Alex Finley is another author that I plan to try in 2023. I do have one of his books on my shelves, and I plan to read that before I read his new release just to make sure that he is kind of an author that I want to continue with. But he is an author that I have heard a lot of great things about, and I kind of want to be on that bandwagon. So hopefully I read this book and I love it. But his new release is coming out on the 7th, and I am absolutely intrigued by the synopsis. It starts, it says, a stay-at-home mom with a past, a has-been rock star with a habit, a reality TV producer with a debt, three disparate lives, one deadly secret. 25 years ago, Jenna, Donnie, and Nico were the best of friends, a bond forged as residents of Savior House, an abusive group home for parentless teens. When the home was shut down after the disappearance of several kids, the three were split up. Though the trauma of their childhood has never left them, each went on to live successful if troubled lives. They haven't seen one another since they were teens, but now are reunited for a single haunted reason. Someone is trying to kill them. To save their lives, the group will have to revisit the nightmare of their childhoods and confront their past, a past that holds the secret to why someone wants them dead. It's a reunion none of them asked for or wanted, but it may be the only way to save their lives. I'm sold. I'm here for it. That sounds absolutely fantastic. I'm all about it. I'm loving it, especially if it has like the reluctant return home, which it just might. I'm not sure. I can't really gather that from the synopsis, but I just love stories that contain that trope. It sounds like we're going to be following these three different characters, so likely three different perspectives, multiple different timelines, and things like that, and I, I'm just here for it. I'm super excited, and I will absolutely be reading this should I decide that Alex Finley is an author for me. I'm coming out on the 14th. That caught my attention, and then I was thinking was adult, but according to this, it's actually young adult, which is a little bit disappointing, but it still sounds really cute, is The Renaissance of Gwen Hathaway by Ashley Schumacher. And based on the cover, it looks like our main character might be plus size, which I love that representation. It says, since her mother's death, Madeline Gwen Hathaway has been determined that nothing in her life will change ever again. That's why she keeps extensive lists and journals, has had only one friend since childhood, and looks forward to the monotony of working the run fair circuit with her father, until she arrives at her mother's favorite end of tour shop to find the fair is under new management and completely changed. Meeting Arthur, the son of the new owners and an actual loop playing bard messes up Maddie's plans even more. For some reason, he wants to be her friend and ropes her into becoming princess of the fair. Now Maddie is overseeing a fair dramatically changed from what her mother loved and going on road trips vastly different from the routine she used to rely on. Worst of all, she's kind of having fun. Ashley Schumacher's The Renaissance of Gwen Hathaway is filled with a wise old magician who sells potions, bottles, gallant knights who are afraid of horses and ride camels instead, kings with a fondness for theatrics, a lazy river castle moat with inflatable crocodile floaties, and a plus-size heroine with a wide open heart if only she just admits it. This sounds flipping adorable. I 
I love the whole Ren Faire vibes here. I love the plus size main character and it definitely sounds like it's going to cover grief which y'all know I am a fan of and if I'm going to read a YA contemporary it's likely going to be a harder hitting one and it definitely sounds like it's going to have elements of this and I am actually very very intrigued by this one even though it does say YA absolutely sounds super adorable and I may just add this to my TBR. March seems to be the month of cozy mysteries because on March 14th we have another one. It's called Vera Wong's Unsolicited Advice for Murderers and it's by Jesse Q. Sutanto. So Vera Wong is a little old lady. She is living above her forgotten tea shop in the middle of Chinatown in San Francisco and one day she goes downstairs to find a dead man in the middle of her tea shop in his outstretched hand a flash drive. Vera doesn't know what comes over her but after calling the cops like any good citizen would she sort of steals the flash drive because why not and she tucks it safely into the pocket of her apron. Why? Because Vera is sure she could do a better job than the police possibly could because nobody sniffs out a wrongdoing quite like a suspicious Chinese mother with time on her hands. Vera knows the killer will be back for the flash drive. All she has to do is watch the increasing number of customers at her shop and figure out which one among them is the killer. What Vera does not expect is to form friendships with her customers and start to care for each and every one of them. As a protective mother hen, will she end up having to give one of her newfound chicks to the police? So we have a little old lady who is determined to solve this murder, but as she starts to solve this murder and she's investigating the customers in her shop, she starts to form bonds and relationships with them and one of them could be a killer and she might have to give one of them up to the police. So honestly, this sounds delightful. I'm not a cozy mystery person at all because typically when I go into mysteries and thrillers, I want them to be dark and gruesome, like the darker the better. That's why Karen Slaughter is one of my favorite authors of all time. But this one just sounds like a really good time. And I think if I go into it knowing that it's going to be a really good time, kind of like with The Golden Spoon, I think if I go into it knowing that it's not going to be a standard mystery thriller, like it's going to be just as comedic as it is going to be mysterious. And it's probably not going to be all that suspenseful, but it is just going to be like a chaotic good time. I might be able to enjoy this one. This is the author of Dial A for Aunties. And I've heard really good things about that one. So if you liked that one, you might enjoy this one as well. If you did like Dial A for Aunties, please let me know and let me know if you think this one would be worth a try when it comes out because it just sounds super fun. I always love a nosy little old lady who is down to solve some crime because you know what? Not gonna lie. That's probably gonna be me in 50 years. I'm gonna be that little old lady that's still listening to true crime podcasts and hoping to catch a murderer someday. That's gonna be me like in my retirement home. When somebody drops dead, I'm gonna be like, that's not natural causes y'all. That's a murder and I'm gonna solve it. So this sounds flippin' adorable and I'm probably gonna add this one to my TBR. Also on the 14th, I have a romance called The Love Wager by Lynn Painter. This sounds like it's going to be a fake dating relationship. It says Hallie Piper is turning over a new leaf. After belly crawling out of a hotel room, hello rock bottom, she decides it's time to become a full-on adult. She gets a new apartment, a new haircut, and a new wardrobe. When she logs into the dating app that she has determined will find her new love, she sees none other than Jack, the guy whose room she'd snuck out of. Through the app and after the joint agreement that they are absolutely not interested in each other, Jack and Hallie become partners in their respective searches for the one. They text each other about their dates, often scheduling them at the same restaurant so that if things don't go well, the two of them can get tacos afterwards. As they pretend to be a couple, lines become blurred and they each struggle to remember why the other was a bad idea to begin with. So this just sounds like a super cute rom-com fake dating. They're each trying to help each other find the one and y'all know that the one is going to be the other person. So this just sounds like a good fun time. Again, this one comes out on March 14th. Also, I did want to mention that this is considered Mr. Wrong number number two. So I believe that there is a first book. This is likely a companion series. So you definitely don't have to read one before you read the other. But I did want to mention that in case you are a purist and want to read book number one first. The last one that I have for March 14th is called Hello Beautiful by Anne Napolitano. So Anne Napolitano wrote Dear Edward and that was actually one that I had picked up from Book of the Month and I unhauled it before reading and it's not because the synopsis did not sound absolutely incredible. Followed a little boy who was the lone survivor of a plane crash and as y'all know I love books that follow grief and it sounded like that's what it was going to be but my problem is is that I think the entire thing was told from Edward's perspective and Edward is a boy of like 12 years old and I just have a really hard time reading books that are told from such a young perspective. So when I saw that Anne Napolitano was coming out with another book that sounded fantastic and it wasn't going to have those same issues, I definitely became intrigued and I actually do have Hello Beautiful on order. And it sounds like there's going to be a lot of complex character dynamics in here. It says, William Waters grew up in a house silenced by tragedy where his parents could hardly bear to look at him, much less love him. So it's a relief when his skill on the basketball court earns him a scholarship to college far away from his childhood home. He soon meets Julia Padovano, a spirited and ambitious young woman who surprises William with her appreciation of his quiet steadiness. With Julia comes her family. She is inseparable from her three younger sisters. Sylvie, the dreamer, is happiest with her nose in a book and imagines a future different from the expected path of wife and mother. Cecilia, the family's artist, and Emmeline, who patiently takes care of all of them. Happily, the Padovanos fold Julia's new boyfriend into their loving, chaotic household. But then darkness from William's past unsurfaces, jeopardizing not only Julia's carefully orchestrated plans for their future, but the sisters' unshakable loyalty to one another. The result is a catastrophic family rift that changes their lives for generations. Will the loyalty that once rooted them be strong enough to draw them back together when it matters most? Vibrating with tenderness, Hello Beautiful is a gorgeous, profoundly moving portrait of what's possible when we choose to love 
love someone not in spite of who they are but because of it. This sounds like the character driven narrative that I'm looking for that has extremely complex character dynamics that has characters that are not black and white and that make you really think and realize that things are not always as they seem and that you can never really know somebody and you can't necessarily judge them based on the actions that you are witnessing. So I'm actually very much intrigued by this book and like I said I do already have it on order and I will be getting into it as soon as I can. The only one that I have coming out on March 21st is the London Seance Society by Sarah Penner. Sarah Penner wrote The Lost Apothecary which was overall a decent time. It wasn't great. It wasn't terrible. It was just overall fine and I am willing to read more from her in the future so I wanted to go ahead and mention this one. It is I believe entirely set in 1873 whereas The Lost Apothecary you have a past timeline and you have a present timeline. I believe this one is fully set in historical times. It says 1873 at an abandoned chateau at the outskirts of Paris a dark seance is about to take place. Led by acclaimed spiritualist Vaudeline de Allaire known worldwide for her talent in conjuring the spirits of murder victims to ascertain the identities of the people who killed them. She is highly sought after by widows and investigators alike. Lena Wicks has come to Paris to find answers about her sister's death but to do so she must embrace the unknown and overcome her own logic driven bias against the occult. When Vaudeline is beckoned to England to solve a high profile murder Lena accompanies her as an understudy but as the women team up with the powerful men of London's exclusive seance society to solve the mystery they begin to suspect that they are not merely out to solve a crime but perhaps entangled in one themselves. So there is definitely murder intrigue. It sounds like this is going to deal with the occult because you have seances here and ghosts and things of that nature. So if you were a really big fan of The Lost Apothecary you might want to go ahead and check this one out. All right then last I have three releases that are coming out on the 28th. The first is by T. Kingfisher. Now T. Kingfisher is an author that I have never read from before but I have seen their books float around a lot in the online bookish community. I've heard a lot about Nettle and Bone and then one of the more newer releases that just came out and so because of that I wanted to talk about their new release here and this is actually described as a southern gothic which is a huge buzzword for me so this might be the one that gets me to jump into T. Kingfisher. It says mom seems off. Her brother's words echo in Sam Montgomery's ear as she turns onto the quiet North Carolina street where their mother lives alone. She brushes the thought away as she climbs the front steps. Sam's excited for this rare extended visit and looking forward to nights with just the two of them drinking boxed wine watching murder mystery shows and guessing who the killer is long before the characters figure it out. But stepping inside she quickly realizes home isn't what it used to be. Gone is the warm cluttered charm her mom is known for. Now the walls are painted in a sterile white. Her mom jumps at the smallest noises and looks over her shoulder even when she's the only person in the room. And when Sam steps out back to clear her head she finds a jar of teeth hidden beneath the magazine worthy rose bushes and vultures are circling the garden from above. Oof. To find out what's got her mom so frightened in her own home Sam will go digging for the truth but some secrets are better left buried. I think that's meant to be taken literally. She's going to dig and find something buried. Okay. So I'm wondering how the house plays a part of it because this is called a house with good bones. So I'm kind of wondering if the house has its own personality in this. Is this a haunted house or if it's like completely separate? If maybe Sam's mom has a past that's coming back for her? I don't know but I'm actually very very intrigued by this and I might be willing to give T. Kingfisher a shot for this one. Another one of the books that I'm highly anticipating for 2023 is The Mostly True Story of Tanner and Louise by Colleen Oakley. Colleen Oakley once again is another author that I want to try in 2023. The synopses of her books just sound incredible and unique and this one is no different and this has that trope of a young person with an older person and I just love that and I love that dynamic and this sounds like it's going to have like Thelma and Louise vibes. So the young person in this is 21 year old Tanner Quimby and she is very unambitious and unmotivated. She just wants to sit around in sweatpants and play video games but she has to have money and so she actually takes a job as a live-in caregiver for an elderly woman named Louise. Now Louise kind of resents this. She feels like she can fully take care of herself. She doesn't want a live-in caregiver but she acquiesces to her daughter's incessant demands that Louise has a caretaker. So when Tanner starts watching out for Louise they kind of start by ignoring each other and Tanner starts noticing some weird things about Louise such as the fact that she keeps her garden shed locked up tighter than a prison and why does Louise suddenly appear in her room with a packed bag at 1 a.m. insisting that they leave town immediately. Thus begins the story of a not to be underestimated elderly woman and an aimless young woman who if they can outrun the mistakes of their past might just have the greatest adventure of their lives. It sounds like it's going to have a lot of different aspects to it. You have the mystery thriller part of this like who was Louise? What was she a part of in the past? What is she running from? Why is she in danger and why does she have to take Tanner with her? You have the older woman, you have the younger woman and what they are going to be able to teach and learn from one another and I think that there's going to be a great bond that forms there and so I'm all about this one. I will absolutely be getting to the story. It is already on my TBR. I am already hyped for it. If you have already read Colleen Oakley please be sure to comment down below and let me know what you have thought of her books in the past because I am very very hyped to read from her. And the final book that I have to mention here also coming out on the 28th is an author that I really really enjoy. It is Robert Dugoni. Now I've only ever read his Tracy Crosswhite series but it is such a well done detective fiction series that is set in Seattle and I'm excited to read more from Robert Dugoni especially outside of the Tracy Crosswhite world in standalones and this actually sounds like it might be a legal thriller. It says Kira Duggan was building a solid reputation as a Seattle prosecutor until 
until her romantic relationship with a senior colleague ended badly. For the competitive former chess prodigy, returning to her family's failing criminal defense law firm to work for her father is the best shot she has. With the right moves, she hopes to restore the family's reputation, her relationship with her father, and her career. Kira's chance to play in the big leagues comes when she's retained by Vince LaRussa, an investment advisor accused of murdering his wealthy wife. There's little hard evidence against him, but considering the couple's impending and potentially nasty divorce, LaRussa faces life in prison. The prosecutor is equally challenging, Miller Ambrose, Kira's former lover, who's eager to destroy her in court on her first homicide offense. As Kira and her team follow the evidence, they uncover a complicated and deadly game that's more than Kira bargained for. When shocking information turns the case upside down, Kira must decide between her duty to her client, her family's legacy, and her own future. This sounds fantastic. I'm always down for a phenomenal legal thriller because I love courtroom drama. I think it is such an art that back and forth. Now personally I do wish that our criminal justice system was not adversarial like that. I don't feel like it does anybody any favors at all but it is a masterpiece to watch especially when the prosecutor and the defense are wonderful at their craft and you wonder who can manipulate the evidence enough to convince the jury. It's just fantastic to watch and I'm excited to know what Robert Dugoni can do with it. I know that he can write fantastic detective fiction. Can he also write fantastic legal thrillers as well? All right y'all that is it. Those are all the releases that I wanted to bring to your attention for March of 2023. Please comment down below and let me know if any of these are on your radar or what books you are excited about in March. And as always if you like this video or if you just like me please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week sometimes three if I have my shit together and there's a third video to film and I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.